Educational LARPs. Long live the revolution, which you played yesterday. is one hour educational LARPs. So I, this is going to be an example that I, I might return to or refer to uh, later on. Here we can see pictures from two different runs. Here is uh, with a school class where, um, with the intended target audience, the 13 to 14 years old, in a church. And um, here is one of uh, another guy who works with us at our company, who played the LARPs. When does a LARP become an educational LARP, or what is the definition of an educational LARP? Well, there isn't any any uh, definition that anyone agrees upon, but I will. Uh, um, I've come up with my own definition, and I'll try it out with you, see if you agree or disagree with me. I would argue that uh, a LARP becomes an educational LARP with the following definition. When the writers slash organizers and or one or more of the players has the explicit intention of the LARP being educational. So it's more of an uh, internal approach to the LARP of it being educational. This definition is handy because it encompasses all the different, different ways in which LARPs can be educational. It's not very handy because you can't pinpoint if any one LARP is educational or not because it's all about like a personal, um, the, the, either the organizers or one or more of the players uh, take on the LARP. Is this going to be educational for me? What do you think about the definition? Like your first thoughts. Most educators are more concerned with outcomes these days. Yeah. In terms of probably it becomes education when someone learns something. Yeah. yeah. But that's also tricky because then you have like to test the outcome of it, and it can't only be like an internal process or a cognitive process of sorts. Also. Well, I was thinking two things from what you said. I would say that that would be the definition of a successful education. Uh, yeah. And yeah. also, that kind of defines any LARP ever in the world because people always tend to learn things from LARPs. So that would be less useful because of that, if, if you would say that it, it is any LARP no, I think or something. You're trying to sell it to a school. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I kind of. I kind of. This definition is so broad that I have, a, I have a quick fix for our lecture for this definition. But first, I'm going to show you three examples of educational LARPs and what I mean by the organizers and or one or more of the players having the intention of it being educational. First LARP uh, is called Good Intentions. Uh, it is a LARP where, um, um, that is about world politics. This is one of the LARPs that we do in schools. As part of the curriculum in what's it, so in, in civic civics yeah, is it social called social studies, studies yeah um, where the um, the uh, students uh, play parts as politicians of different countries uh, not real life countries uh, fictional countries and uh, this photo is taken from the World Congress where they debate different questions. So we as organizers have the intention of this being educational. It's part of the uh, curriculum for the students. It's compulsory. So they know it. it's supposed to be educational and hopefully have the approach of it being educational. So quite clear cut and educational LARP. Uh, then we have the LARP Castle yes, Lavin. I showed you a few pictures from it uh, before. Uh, 1982, it was the summer AIDS came to New York City. The organizers didn't have an explicit intention of this being educational. But for me as a player, when I signed up for the LARP, one of my main motivations was that well, I'm born in 1985 and I have no, no clear view of this time period in history. I want something to motivate me to learn more about it. So I read up on it, I played the LARP, I discussed with people afterwards, and I feel that I've actually learned 
uh, parts of, of the actual history, comparing the actual history to the events happening in the LARP. For me, it was an educational experience and I had the uh, explicit um, view of it being educational. So that's, that's somewhat semi-educational then. And then we have uh, the, um, the example that Teresa talked about. This is one of the fancy campaigns in Sweden called Eleria, which is uh, the organizers host it as being recreational, not educational, for fun. Uh, this group went to the LARP just to have fun, but you can't get away from the fact that they have actually learned something uh, about uh, maybe historical costumes or at least about sewing. I talked to some of them, they have learned how to march together. Um, to a beating drum, things like that. But if they did not have the the intention of it being an educational game, then according to my definition, the game wasn't educational, although the output of them learning something was there. So it's up for debate. But for the purpose of this lecture, I'm going to not talk as much about educational games, since, as you can see, it's quite a fussy area. I'm going to talk about LARPing in schools. So then it becomes really much more clear cut. So I'm going to focus the presentation now to the LARPs that we do in schools as part of the curriculum in collaboration with subject teacher. The goal and purpose is explicit to the participants. We try always to, to make sure that they understand like why are we going to do this LARP? How does this tie into your uh, education? Um, it's also mandatory participation. So, so I've kind of narrowed it down. If this is the, the possible swear of the edu LARPs, then um, I'm mostly going to talk in the more specific swear of school LARPs. <clears throat> now, when we as a company are out LARPing in schools, um, some interesting things tend to, to happen because LARPing with the students uh, or the children uh, is, is not very much like ordinary, uh, ordinary, an ordinary school day when someone is, uh, is uh, having a lecture or teaching them something or making them read a book. So <clears throat> we have focus on participation and influence from the student as opposed to like the traditional way of, of learning things in school when, when the focus is put on the teacher. So we're moving away from teacher focus and moving uh, focus to participation and influence. And inter-student focus is rewarded in LARPs because we want them to interact with each other, not only interact with the teacher or the book or, or whatever other form of, 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 of uh, educational tools that way. We want them to interact with each other. And long periods of silence and concentration is not a goal in itself, as it often is, uh, at least in Sweden in schools. Uh, you want people to, to be silent and listen to what the teacher is saying or reading a book or something like that. The results of this is that we have some students that find a new and constructive role in the groups, while others are struggling in this new environment. And what I mean by that is that some students who have a hard time just sitting down, being silent, listening. All people doesn't learn in the same way, right? Uh, and, and some of these students find LARPing to be very useful because they can actively engage in the subject in a, in a manner and a way that they can't do otherwise. Other students, on the other hand, in every class there are students who have like cracked the code of going to school. They, they, they understand the system of the school. They know how it works, like what, uh, what am I supposed to read to pass a test? How, how does, uh, does, um, does this school thing really work? When, when we throw them into a LARP, some of these students are hugely confused. They're like, so what am I supposed to learn here? And we're like, no, experience it and we'll discuss it afterwards. Yeah, but, but if you would say the main points for the exam later, what would that be? Oh, there are no main points in this LARP. We just want you to interact with each other. 
that some, some of these students then get hydrophosphorated. So, of course, this doesn't fit everyone, but our hope and our, our goal is that uh, providing LARPs in schools, then that way of, uh, then that provides an alternative for the students who really feel that they can learn uh, through this way of interacting with each other uh, through the LARP. Any questions so far? This is perfectly clear. Best slides ever. <laughs> Actually, I've got one. Yeah? Um, the focus of the education, uh, it seems to be, I guess it seems to be within understanding the context. Is it, would you agree that it's about understanding the context rather than learning maybe self concrete? That's a very good question, and that's exactly what I'm going to come on in on this next slide. So I have my own model. Again, this is not like a widely recognized model since it only exists on my computer. But I have a model for, for how this school LARPing works uh, that I have come up with together with my colleagues. And <clears throat> I say that there are different categories of learning. Of course, you can make any categories of learning. But uh, there are three distinct categories which we could pinpoint immediately at what kind of learning can take place through LARPing. And where the person, personal development category or the group development, um, which is about social skills, higher confidence in self, self-reflection, those kinds of things, or group development la like coming together as a group, uh, finding out how to work with each other. Then we have the category that are called processes. Both social processes are being able to read social processes, but also looking at the situation, defining the system, like in what context are we dealing with. Well, I'm talking about cause and effect, those kinds of processes that you can see in a lot in some ways. And then at the end we have the, the factual knowledge, like the year and dates and things like that. So this is the categories that I usually talk about, like when we talk about what can you learn through LARPing. And if I go into to more depth into these categories, or, or would you say, like, is there any category missing right now? Where you're like, well, I haven't thought about that, has he? Or do they overlap or anything? They seem to overlap. They, they seem to overlap, yeah, I think so too. To, but to me, it's more of, a, more of a, the model not being maybe 100% accurate than being useful, as we were talking about in the lunch break, because they, they slightly overlap in, in some places, but it's good to be able to talk about the different types of learning, in, in one way at least. Um, I'll, I'll go into the, the different categories and we'll see what you, you think about them. When does the learning process take place in these different categories? And one could argue that they could take place, all categories could take place anywhere, but what I'm trying to pinpoint here is the main learning process. Where does the main learning process take place? When it comes to personal development or group development, I would say before the LARP in the workshops, you could pose, uh, like doing the workshops with your group could be uh, for, for some people, it is a group development experience, like our group yesterday, coming together, people who didn't know each other at all, through the workshop, it felt as though we were coming together a little bit more as a group. During the LARP, uh, some of the learning process takes place. We're talking about cooperation and acceptance. When we talk about acceptance, when we're out LARPing in schools, we very often find that there's a low trust in the acceptance level in the group sometimes. Like before the LARP, people are like, is anyone even going to take part in this LARP? Because they don't believe that the other ones will actually dress up and play roles and things like that. And actually, when, when we go out to schools, we almost have no dropouts at all. Through my years working with Leibach and I can come to think of two occasions where some people have 
have opted out of the LARC. Of course, there might be more because the people might might not come to school the day when the LARC, when they know we're going to have a LARC. So the, it might be a higher number, but it's not very common at all. And when um, <coughs> when the the group goes through with the LARC, it, it raises the the level of, of acceptance we tend to feel like in in the uh, the group that the group actually has done something together and also what what possibilities to to social interactions can you have with the people in the group being someone else like stepping into someone else's shoes thinking about like how would it actually be for this person uh, for some people uh, that is a benefit for for personal development uh, trying to to think about the lives of other people and acting outside of the comfort zone because you are in some way taking a risk when, when you're LARPing, a social risk. But when everyone's doing it, that, that can actually be something that pushes you out of your comfort zone. If you are a very shy person, you can try out different social roles and elaborate with that within a somewhat safer space than just going to school one day and say, well, I'm going to try out a new social role today. I'll be the chatty one. Uh, that can be quite hard, but if you can try it out in a lot, then that might actually start some process on a journey of becoming uh, a person that might not be as shy. Uh, I talked yesterday with a local psychologist here uh, at the university, and he told me, because I talked about this workshop that we were conducting, that he actually had some results, significant results about autistic people and children. That actually, you should think that because people are like more autistic and having this Asperger syndrome, that they don't want to get involved with other people. Actually, the logical conclusion would be that they will not be good in labs. But actually, the opposite conclusion is true. Yeah. So I don't know if you have experience on that yes. in schools, like the, the quiet people and the quiet kids and so on. Well, when it comes to Asperger, uh, I haven't worked as much with Asperger kids as you have. I uh, yeah. But the and this is both our own experience and when we talked with the edulapers in in Denmark, they have a school where the whole curriculum uh, for the school, the Esterskole, um, Esterskole, yeah. is made up by LARPing, and they have uh, quite a lot of uh, applicants who have Aspergers. And I heard it was like thirty percent. Yeah, and we'll, when we have LARP with people with Aspergers, they're like the most skilled LARPers. Yeah, it's remarkable. Like, like much higher level LARPers than any other classes we're, we're uh, LARPing with. We have no idea why, why it is this way, but I, I have research one theory, be there, because there but hasn't been any research. Yeah, but we uh, go in depth and get some explanations. For yeah, problems. but like my guess would be that in a LARP, we take social systems and we codify them to some extent. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you put on a layer of a role and you uh, have explicit instructions on how you can and uh, interact with others and when you get that like codified or that system of social interaction then they're, they're highly capable of, of performing the LARP and doing all the social interactions in the LARP. I also think that there's a level of awkwardness to the, the codifying of social structures is awkward to teenagers who are socially skilled because they're not used to analyzing like that. So when they have to be out of, because it's taking them out of their comfort zone because they know how school works, they, they know how, how everyday works, and now suddenly we're in France in the 18th century and there's a level of awkwardness that the kids with Asperger's, they don't, that's not a new thing for them mm. to have to like figure out, right, how are we talking, mm. what is happening. So that's like, that's every day for them. Yeah. It's, and this is, of course, pure speculation. Then after the LARP, we can have reflections, both group development reflections and personal development reflection, and parallels to reality, like what in this LARP um, actually moved me or something like that, which could lead to, to insights about yourself or your personal development. So I would say when it comes to the personal development, group development category, the main parts where that occur is both before, during and after the lock. Like that's the conclusion. Moving on to processes. Now the processes 
the uh, learning process of the processes doesn't occur as much before the LARP. Because then we're talking about characters, we're workshopping a little bit of processes, but not like the main part. During the LARP, it's about understanding context, it's about understanding connections, events, cause and effect. Well, what we're talking about here is that it can be hard to pinpoint from reading a book about the French Revolution, like how is this all connected? Who are these people really? In, in what way do they relate to each other in society? And when we play the French Revolution LARP, even though it's not historically accurate, you can then later on map on the historically accurate uh, knowledge, but have that, uh, those connections and that context that you got through the LARP. You could uh, get sort of an epiphany and like, aha, this is how they could relate in society. If we take the, the system of the inn, but, but expand it to society, in what in it would be historically accurate and what wouldn't? In what way would this group relate to each other? Where are they on, on the social hierarchy in this society? Things like that. Those kinds of processes. But also social processes. Uh, like, like reading uh, the, the, the room and the social processes going on. After the LARP, I touched upon that, but reflections and parallels to reality, parallels to in the instance of the long live the revolution law, uh, would it actually, could it have happened in history? Or, but if it couldn't, then what are the differences? What are the similarities? When it comes to factual knowledge, oh, yes, a question. Uh, a quick question. Should I jump back? So, yeah, great slides. When you do reflection there, are you focusing on something different? So, if, for instance, if you're looking at a process, is your reflection would be more focused on this is what happened in the lab, we can abstract it out to the core, the core sort of like aspects of it, and how can you find parallels to reality? Is this something, is it more concrete in, in that case, if you're looking at a process, how you can abstract what happened and put in the real world and other situation than maybe in the previous kind of... Yes, uh, I think so. Because the previous slide is very like personal to all the participants in the LARP. Like what is your thoughts and emotions about this? Then we would be talking about those kinds of things. Like how did it feel in the group? Do, do you have any parallels to reality? Have you ever been in a situation where it has felt like this in a group even though it wasn't as high stakes as someone be, someone's head being chopped off? But it's a bit softer questions, right, when it comes to personal development and group development. But when it comes to the processes, there you might actually have these questions where, where you put in parts of actual knowledge as well and uh, try to look at the French society and uh, the similarities and differences from the law. Did that answer anything? I think I'll leave the word to you. Yeah, I just had a kind of a specific example. Uh, in the game that, the, the politics game, that's a good adventure game, that's uh, uh, they, the players make a lot of choices. Uh, for instance, if, and you play four countries and rich countries, you have many choices in the game. And at first, it's almost a board game for a few lessons, and then you do a lot. And with the reflections and parallels to reality on a personal level, personal development level, it would be a lot about a discussion about, I didn't think that I would dare get up in front of everyone and talk, but I did several times. I made speeches, that was interesting, I'm learning something about myself. And here it would be more like, uh, so your country, um, chose to print up new money because you were having a financial crisis. Does that make sense? Would that make sense? Is that something, was that smart or not of your country to do? And we're still not talking about facts. We're not talking about, do we know countries that have done this? Uh, yeah. we can, we're still talking about getting in the mindset. And I know I've run this game quite a few times, the good intention game and Lush has as well. And I've had people come up to me after class, and this is 15 year olds, and, and say that after playing this game, I used to look at headlines in the paper and I'd be like, politicians are really stupid. 
they don't know what they're doing at all. And now I read the headlines and I'm like, oh yeah. I, I understand what you were going through here. That must have been horrible to try to work that thing out. Uh, so it's that kind of, it's not personal, it is on the subject, but it's more along, not factual knowledge, but getting in the mindset of how things work. Yeah, in, in that game, for instance, like people before playing the game this 15 years old can be like, but the environmental issues, why doesn't all countries just sign all the treaties? And then we're done with it. But after playing the game, they're like, yeah, I see now that the question is a bit more complicated than that. Even though they've only been dealing with fictional facts. And we haven't touched upon the factual knowledge yet. But they know that the process is more complicated in itself than just signing all the treaties and everyone is happy. Um, so that's, that's a bit more about. Did that in some way answer your question? Yes, I can see how you would be asking different things. Yeah. Because you're focusing on, on the different aspects of it. And it depends on what game, what we're trying to do with the game. Every game is different. One game might be about processes, mostly. And, and it might be an ethics game, or like we're discussing values in this game. And then you would focus on this, like this and the first slide and factual knowledge would not be interesting, so you wouldn't discuss that. And there's definitely a set amount of... You cannot debrief infinitely, and especially not with 14-year-olds who just want to go from school. Mm -hmm. You have a very limited window to get them to, to reflect. Yeah. So you have to be so, very so you can't. focused on what you want to get out of it. You have to know that you absolutely cannot just go in and like, have a nice conversation that that's a recipe for disaster. And we very seldom have like this broad spectrum approach, like trying to get everything into all the games. And we try to pinpoint some other categories depending on what the goal, well, the, this part of the curriculum is. Moving on to the factual knowledge. Now, factual knowledge I've divided into two different groups. First group being actual context, defined as we're actually playing what we want to learn. So if we want to learn something about the French Revolution, 1793, we're LARPing the French Revolution in 1793. Actual context. Before the LARP, we're doing research about the French Revolution. They Very often they've studied with their subject teacher, history, things like that, before we even enter the picture, because the French Revolution is, is part of the history curriculum in, in, in school. Uh, so they've done research. They can also uh, get some of the information, like we're going to play this group, uh, depending on what LARP it is, and they will especially research that group and compare it to the, the factual knowledge, the history, the real history, if we're talking about historical LARPs. During the LARP, not so much. As you experienced yesterday, like, did we actually learn anything new, factually, in the LARP? One could argue that some tasks you, you might have, have learned if we would have a, a real old-fashioned uh, oven, we might have learned how much wood you need to, to fire such an oven. But it wouldn't be about the French Revolution. Uh, so, so during the LARP, you actually don't learn a lot of new factual knowledge. To some extent, you can, but mainly, again, mainly before the LARP and after the LARP, when you reflect and you do further research, uh, and you compare it to reality, parallels to reality. Okay, I'm going to stop hijacking your lecture, but uh, during the LARP, it is in almost impossible to see the difference between factual, like facts that are true about the revolution and what something is, someone is influencing. So there might be lots of true facts, but it's very hard to know where they are. Yeah, because you need a afterwards discussion to like disentangle what parts were true and what which parts weren't, and what parts were only improvisations from some other of the characters. But there is also another approach to factual knowledge, and that is what I call the transferred context. The transferred context being defined as uh, we play in another context than the context we want to learn something about. So, for instance, we may want to learn about the French Revolution, 1793. So we play a sci-fi LARP 
that is about a society where there is oppression and maybe feudalistic structures. Someone has uh, overthrown the galactical king and we're on this spaceship traveling towards a supernova or something. When it comes to transferred contexts, before the LARP, all the thing you learn about the LARP, then none of that will be true. We will actually be talking about the world of the LARP, this galactical world in this sci-fi example, the characters in that galactical world. So mainly after the LARP, we take the experiences from the LARP and say, if this, uh, how does this relate to the French Revolution? What parallels can we see to reality? Uh, we can start studying the French Revolution, but we have a common shared experience to, to, to talk about. Very often this isn't done with history, but one example I have of this is a LARP called uh, Alpha Omega, which is about um, uh, gender equality. Gender equality is a subject that can be, be hard to, to discuss sometimes, and that's set in uh, sci-fi settings with a caste system, so there are two different castes, the alphas and the omegas. Slightly different what, uh, what, uh, uh, what agency they have in society, things like that. And then afterwards we talk about is this relevant when we're talking about gender or, or class or, or ethnicity or race, things like that. That, that game is mostly focused on, on gender equality, but you could do the same thing with, with these other subjects as well. In those cases, in order to, like, to not get an inflammatory discussion <laughs> uh, from the starting point, it can be good to have a transferred context and a common shared experience to work from. We also did, uh, did another LARP that was a fancy LARP uh, where there, there's, there also was a, a caste system. Uh, and uh, between, we, did, uh, the, we played the LARP, uh, there was first one LARP day and then there was a sequel two weeks afterwards and then they switched uh, which cast they had played so they got to play both casts and then we discussed if this was relevant to to uh, the real world and what parallels we can find. So if we combine all this I've been talking about now in, into like one uh, one model, it would actually look like this, right? Our model for educational LARPs. Our as in, in Liebach start and the LARP workshop. So we have the three learning categories and I've highlighted when the main part of the learning experience takes place. Before, during, after, when it comes to personal and group development. Processes, during, after. Actual context, before, after. Transferred context, after. As you can see, there is only uh, one of these places where the learning process takes place that occurs in all of these examples. And that's afterwards. So afterwards, how we work with the lab afterwards is the most important thing uh, for learning something from a LARP, I would like to state. The time spent working with the LARP afterwards is essential for the educational aspect. Now, there is a LARP that was done in Norway called Prisoner for a Day. It was a LARP about human rights. And uh, I, I wasn't part playing the, the LARP, but I talked with the designer of the LARP, who ran the LARP, for the Red Cross, I think, doing it with different schools quite a lot of times. And they had access to uh, an old, uh, since long abandoned prison. And they got the school classes there, they dressed them up in these orange overalls, and uh, they got to be prisoners for a day. Uh, treated as prisoners, but on the level you, you could treat a 14 or, or 15 or 16 year old. And uh, they went out to the classes three months afterwards and interviewed some of the classes and they, uh, they uh, um, compared those interviews with how much time they or the subject teacher had spent talking about the LARP, working with the LARP afterwards. And what they found out was that there was more or less a, a sliding scale 
from the the classes where they had gone to the LARP, done the LARP, but hadn't worked with the LARP afterwards, not talked with the LARP, they ended up at the very far point of the scale where uh, the uh, students remember the LARP as some kind of event, more or less. Like, yeah, we had a day off, we were at a prison. It's kind of cool. More or less like going skiing with the class or doing something else. Not very educational at all. They could not, in, in any good ways, uh, draw parallels to uh, human rights. When they discussed immigration in Norway, the discussions were, were uh, not very... Uh, they didn't have like a wide range of arguments. Uh, they, they were quite black and white, the discussions. Also having uh, racial slurs and those things in them. Um, and the teachers who had worked the most with the LORP afterwards had, had uh, the students there could clearly link it to human rights. They could clearly see different sides of, of, of the issue, different problems with it. They could discuss immigration in, in a much more uh, adult or grown up way, um, which this game was also about um, when they compared it to, to, to uh, the Norwegian society today uh, uh, and to human rights uh, and things like that. And even though that these classes, so some of those classes, the students were two years younger than in the classes, we just remembered it as a, like some kind of one-shot event. So I think that was really, um, really a good example of how, how essential the working with the lab afterwards is. Uh, from a pedagogical perspective, uh, so from a Pedagogical perspective. Yeah. So you you've been saying that really you learn a lot before, and you need, you you learn a lot after. What happens during is not maybe not always that important. Is it some sort of maybe constructive approach where you give a problem to students without giving them maybe all the tools to spend some time figuring it out? How they figure it out, or if they don't figure it out, is not that important. What's important is talking about how they try to figure out afterwards yeah. and try to build. So, is it the same kind of approach? Yeah, almost the same kind of approach. But the 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 main thing about playing the LARP very often in how we work with it afterwards is to have a common shared experience to refer to. Uh, so that's like the the um, one of the, the the good things about playing the LARP. And, but as you say, there are very much similarities, like we don't really care about how they play the LARP, just that they have played the LARP and experienced this thing. And almost, if the LARP doesn't crash, which I've never been in a school LARP that has, has crashed that terribly, we can always use it as a starting point for uh, conversations and uh, things afterwards. And uh, that's what I have. Uh, Examples are one in the next slide, like what do we do afterwards with the students? Well, you do have a common experience. It's important that it's yeah, common. Exactly. It, uh, because if we would have two classes that would have locked the same lock but not at the same time, or like half of the class and half of the class, then it would be harder to work with it afterwards because we can't refer to the same events and we can can't discuss whether this process is. Uh, a, a um, good metaphor for the, a similar process in reality or not, because then they haven't been in the same place doing the same thing. So example of methods that we work with afterwards is, and, and here I, I only like threw up as many examples uh, as I could fit into two slides, of course discussions. Like what was so felt realistic or unrealistic? Why examples of other situation in real life that relates to the content? What's similar and what's different? What do you think happened after the LARP ended? Like if you continue the narrative in your head, where would it have gone? Do you think, or where could it could it go in, in multiple ways? What did the different characters want to achieve? Why did they want to achieve that? 
why was it so important for Truford to actually find someone who was guilty and not to find someone who Truford had good evidence for being guilty? Like, what, does that say anything about Truford? Is that even interesting in our example from yesterday? How would you have done in a similar situation? And when someone answers a question like that, like, is it even possible to talk about, or, or, or could you be that true to yourself, that you, you know yourself that good, depending on the stakes of the situation, of course. Written exercises as well. Diaries, either uh, out of character diaries when we're working with the law, or also character diaries like writing diaries during the LARP or in between the LARP, like now you're getting a written, uh, if we have multiple LARPs, now you're getting written exercise to like write the diary of your character. Uh, writing articles about what happened in the LARP. These things, writing diaries and writing articles, that's, uh, or writing letters, of course, to other characters, uh, is a way of making them re reflect back upon the LARP so that they not only have experienced that, but they have processed it in some way, these written exercises, to process the LARP, to make it into one coherent uh, experience that they can relate to, is more or less the, the uh, reason for doing those written exercises.